Okay, so thank you for coming along today. My name is Isabel and I am one of the research support librarians based in the research support team in the library. And here with me today, I've got Yvette, who will be monitoring the chat um, in case any questions come up as we're going through. And she will either deal with them in the chat or she'll interrupt me so that I can handle them as we're going along. Or if she thinks it's something that we can keep until the end, we've got about 15 minutes at the end of the session um, to go through some more uh, detailed questions. So today's session is on working with personal and sensitive research data. I'm recording the um, webinar. Um, everyone's names will be anonymized um, when we share it. And I'll be sending that out either this afternoon or tomorrow along with the slides. So um, don't frantically take too many notes because I will be sending the slides out. Okay, so before I start, I'm just going to show you our website, which is a brilliant place for finding loads of information about research data management, about data management plans, data sharing, um, data storage, all of that good stuff, as well as everything else that we support, like open access publishing, um, research visibility, and it also has a link to the orb which you can see on the right, which is our blog, and that has all the most up-to-date news from our team and from um, the sector in general. So here's the um, URL at the bottom. Please go and check that out if you haven't already. Uh, it's a really good website with loads and loads of really useful information on it. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to look at what personal and what sensitive data are. Sensitive data is now actually called special category data. Um, we're going to look at what um, support the OU can offer you, and then we're going to look at some data management hints and tips. Um, it's important to note that in this session, I won't be talking about data sharing. That uh, happens in another webinar, which is happening after Christmas. Um, but when we're talking about research data management, we always have to think about research data management with the end goal of making your research data public if possible. So the mantra here is as open as possible, as closed as necessary. So when we're thinking about how we manage our data during a project, it's really important to keep that end goal of data sharing in mind so that we are collecting the appropriate consent and the appropriate information that we need in order to share it with the wider public once our projects finish. And then finally, um, there'll be some more information at the end, lots of useful links, and I'm hoping for around 10 to 15 minutes of question time at the end. Um, so let's get started. So first of all, what are personal data? So personal data are information that relate to an identified or identifiable individual. Opinions and facts about individuals can be personal data too. Here is the definition according to the GDPR. So personal data, information that relate to identified or identifiable um, in individual. So the GDPR was brought in in 2018. It is a supplement to the Data Protection Act and it applies to anyone who processes the data of EU residents. If you're working with personal data outside of the EU, make sure you're fully aware of the data protection laws that apply. GDPR provides greater rights and protection to individuals across the EU. Now, obviously, um, we have recently left the EU, so things are slightly different now um, since GDPR came in. So now we're actually working with the UK GDPR, which is exactly the same as the EU GDPR. And at the moment, the two of them align and there's no conflict between them. And as long as we're complying with UK GDPR, we're also complying with EU GDPR. But please keep an eye out for if anything to do with this changes, um, because as all things with Brexit uh, are, it is liable to change. So keep an eye on the internet site if the data protection team get any inkling about, um, about uh, any changes coming up, then they will definitely pop them on there um, so that you'll know that those changes are happening. And then also, because I know there's loads of projects at the EU, uh, at the OU, sorry, got the EU on the mind now, at the OU, where um, researchers are working with participants outside of the EU, 
it's really important that you're also aware of the data protection laws within those countries. And if you need any advice on this, then please feel free to contact me or the data protection team. So personal data only includes information which relates to natural people who are, um, who can be identified, who are directly identifiable from the information in question or who can be indirectly identified from that information in combination with other information. So it might be that um, your data says Joe blogs and that's directly identifiable because we can see that the person's name is Joe blogs. Or it might be that your data says um, a 20 something male who lives in Stockton on Tees and works at an accountant's. But there's actually only one accountant in Stockton on Tees and there's only one person in their 20s there who's a man. So even if you've removed names, your um, data may still be identifiable indirectly. And it's really important to remember that when you're anonymizing your data and when you're thinking about what information you're re re uh, releasing. OK, so individuals could also be identified by a number or by an IP address or by a cookie identifier. Um, so there's loads of ways that individuals could be identified that aren't just by their name and address. OK, so under the GDPR, you must have a lawful basis to process research data. Oh, sorry, process personal data. And for research, this is usually by gaining informed consent. And you'll probably have seen this numerous times when signing up to services online. They usually ask you to tick a box which gives you consent for them to process your data. But don't forget that consent for processing personal data is completely separate from ethical consent. This is an entirely separate requirement about consent to participate in research, which you must also have if you are collecting personal data from your participants. So the data protection requirements are different to the ethics requirements, and it's really important that you understand both. And in this session, we'll really be looking mostly at the data protection requirements. Now, if you're handling personal data, you need to fill in the information asset register and instructions on how to do this are on the data protection internet site, which I've linked to on this slide. Okay, so any personal data you collect needs to go onto that information asset register and you should have um, a, a nominee within your faculty or within your unit who will be able to assist you with putting your information on there. And the acronym for those people are IGLOs. Um, I think it stands for Information Government Liaison Officer. So um, if you're struggling with that, either contact your IGLO or if you can't find them, then just feel free to email me and I'll, I'll work out who it is you need to ask for help. Okay, now, Sensitive data are different to personal data. And in fact, we don't call them sensitive data, we call them special category data. Okay, so it is personal data that needs more protection because it is sensitive. You must always ensure that you have a legal basis for handling this type of data. For research, this will either be explicit consent or for research purposes. But there are further conditions that you must also satisfy for processing special category data. And to understand these, have a look at that link to the Information Commissioner's Office and contact Data Protection Team if you need advice. So the special category data are any data that reveal racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic data, biometric data, or data concerning health or a natural person's sex life or sexual orientation. Okay. So if you are handling special category data, you will need to complete a data protection impact assessment form or a DPIA. And you can access the DPIA through the data protection intranet site. Can I just check that um, there's no sound for anybody or if it's just a few people who've got the problem? Okay, sound fine for... All right, I'll keep going because it looks like it's just a problem for a couple of people. I, I, I well, actually, they can't hear me, so I'm not going to give any advice. <laughs> okay, so 
If you're handling special category data, you need to complete a data protection impact assessment form. So that's a DPIA. And that can be accessed through the data protection intranet site, which I've linked to here. Now, even if you don't think you are handling special category data, you should still complete the screening questions just in case to make sure that you definitely don't have to fill in this DPIA form because you don't want to get two months down the line in your project or a year down the line in your project and find out that you should have done. Even if you don't have to fill in that DPIA form, you do still need to fill in the information asset register. And if you do have to fill in the DPIA form, you still need to fill in the information asset register. Okay, all this information is on the data protection internet site. And if you're still confused after you've had a look at it and after I've explained it today, then please feel free to get in touch with me or with the data protection team. Okay. There are also some rights um, associated with GDPR that you need to be aware of, especially when you're writing your consent forms and when you're planning how you will store your data. And these are the right to be informed, the right of access, the right to rectification, the right to erasure, the right to pro uh, restrict processing, the right to data portability, the right to object, and rights in relation to automated decision making and profiling. And there's more information about these on the Information Commissioner's Office. So it's really important that you're aware of what these rights are and what they mean and what they mean for you when you're doing your research. But actually, now I'm going to move on from data protection because I could sit here and talk about it for about three hours um, and we've got other things to talk about. So um, if anyone has any questions right now about anything that I've spoken about yet, please do pop them into the chat box. Um, otherwise, I will continue talking. So the next section is on OU support and requirements. I'm just waiting to see what these um, comments in the chat box are before I continue talking. Okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to, oh, here we go. When do you have to complete the information asset register? So I would recommend that you um, complete this if you are doing some funded research after you have uh, received confirmation that your project will be going ahead, I would complete that information asset register um, before you start collecting data is the important thing. You could, you could um, put your information in while you're submitting your bid, but because you aren't sure that your bid is going to be successful, unfortunately, uh, it might not be the best use of your time. Oh, data protection impact assessment. I think it might be best. Oh, hold on. Let's see, is that the same question? You're processing anonymized sensitive data, so non identifiable. Do you only fill in the second form? It depends when it's anonymized. Um, <laughs> so if the if the data that you're using has always been anonymized, so you're collecting it from a third party source where someone else has already anonymized it for you, then I think you don't need to fill in either thing because you're not working with personal data. But if you are the person who's going to be seeing the personal data before it's anonymized, then I think you have to fill in both. I have to complete. I'd be collecting it anonymously. I think you still need to fill in the the both both of them if you're the person doing the collection. But that's quite a specific question that actually I think I would put to the data protection team. Um, OK, and I think that the other question there is just about the same thing. So I have to complete the information asset register. If I already have the sensitive data provided by a third party. I don't think you need to fill in the information asset register if the data is already anonymized. But if it is uh, unanonymized, then you do need to fill it in. OK, so the, here are some links to the other OU teams who can help with these things. So there's data protection, who I've mentioned numerous times. 
um, and the IGLOs who are within your unit, so you can find out who this is on the Data Protection Intranet site. There's the Human Research Ethics Council, who if you are working with personal or special category data, you probably um, will already have uh, come across and you need to make sure that you register your project with HREC and you may need to complete a full ethics review depending on the nature of your project. And then finally, there's Information Security who have loads of brilliant advice about how to um, stay safe while working and avoid data breaches. And in fact, when I um, send out the slides for these, I'm going to send out some extra information that Information Security team have asked me to share with you. Um, so that you can really get to grips with what they their requirements are from you in order to keep any personal or um, special category data safe. Okay, so now I'm going to give you eight top tips um, for working with this kind of data. So in at number one, we've got to write a data management plan. I feel like I'm saying this every single day because it's such a useful thing to do. It's a project document which describes the data or the similar evidence, so any underpinning materials that a project will collect, how it will be stored during the project, how it will be archived at the end of the project, and how access will be granted where appropriate. Now, we always advise anyone who's working with any type of data to write a data management plan, but they're even more important when the data in question is sensitive and personal, as thinking about those issues at the outset of a project helps reduce the risk of data breaches. There's loads and loads of guidance on our um, website on how to write a data management plan. And we've got a tool called DMP Online, which I've linked to on this slide, um, which helps you to write a data management plan. It has templates and embedded guidance, which take you through step by step each section of the data management plan um, so that you can write it both in compliance with your funders requirements or if you don't have a funder with the OU requirements. Um, and if you need any advice on writing a data management plan or if you'd like us to review your data management plan, then please do just get in touch and um, send us an email. Um, it would be really great if we could have uh, any um, data management plans that require review at least a week before they need to be submitted because they do take a little time sometimes to review. Um, yeah, so I think that this is a really, really important tip. And uh, if you haven't written one already for your project and you're already halfway through, then please do consider just taking the time to sit down for an hour or so and jot down everything that you need to do to make sure that your data is being kept safe. Um, Yvette, can you share the um, inbox for me, please? Thank you. Okay, so my second tip is to choose your data storage carefully. So when you're thinking about um, where you want to store your data, think about who needs to access it. Is it just you? Are there members of other members of your team who need to access it? Are those members of your team within the OU or are they outside the OU? Are there different levels of access necessary for different files? If you do have different access levels, uh, a requirement for different access levels, then um, SharePoint is a really, really good solution to use for this, but there are other solutions which are detailed in the guide to OU data storage solutions that I've attached to this slide. Also think about um, whether some of your files contain um, special category data, should you be password protecting them, especially if you're going to be um, sharing them with people. Please don't use Dropbox or any other third party cloud storage that hasn't been approved by OU to store personal sensitive data, because if a data breach does happen, and they do unfortunately happen on these third party cloud storage um, solutions, then the OU will not be able to support you um, with that. Um, also, we don't know a lot about Dropbox, where the data is being kept. It could be being kept outside of the EU. It could be that the um, company goes out of business. So it's generally just not a brilliant place to be keeping your precious research data, especially when the OU has numerous data storage solutions available to you that are all quite easy to use. So there's SharePoint, there's OneDrive, there's your um, server, um, there's Auto, there's several places that you could keep it that are better than putting it on Dropbox. 
Okay, so when you're thinking about storage, also think about data minimization. So data minimization means not collecting more data than you need for your purposes. So for example, if you're running a study looking at reading habits in undergraduate students, you don't need information about those students' underlying health conditions or hair colour, for example. Also, make sure that you're not keeping personal data for any longer than you need to. Um, a big one that I see in data management plans is that people are um, recording transcripts of interviews, for example, and then uh, recording interviews and then creating transcripts of those interviews which are anonymised. And once that transcript has been created, in most cases, it's not really necessary to keep the original recording because you've got all the words in an anonymised form written down. Obviously, there are some cases where the recording is useful when you're looking at sort of inflections in voice or it's important to hear the way that people are talking. But in most cases, once your data has been anonymised, you can probably get rid of the personal data. So here I've said destroy personal data once anonymization is complete, if you can. I understand there are some situations where that's impossible. Also, if possible, avoid using identifiers during data collection. And this is hard. I mean, um, Yvette and I were talking about this this morning because I was saying that when we share the recordings from these sessions, we always um, anonymize the chat, but sometimes we find it really hard to not mention people's names when we're answering questions. <laughs> so we're making a really concerted effort to avoid using people's names during this session so that our um, recording is completely anonymous by when, we, when we share it. And similarly, if you're doing an interview or if you're um, collecting survey data, it is possible to collect it already anonymized um, do you really need to collect people's names and email addresses when you're collecting data? And don't collect more data than you need for your purposes. Okay, there's a question about retention time, and um, it really depends on which thing you're talking about. But in terms of research data, uh, we'd say 10 years. But then there are other rules for different parts of it, and actually before you um, before you archive any research data, we expect you to go through a selection and preservation, uh, a selection and appraisal um, process so that you're only keeping what you really need to keep or what would be useful to keep. OK, so generally 10 years, but it depends. OK, so my fourth tip is to ensure that you gain valid consent. Oh, here we go. Tend to destroy recordings as soon as transcripts are read and okay by so Yeah, that's perfect. So destroying recordings as soon as the transcripts are read and okay by participants and the transcript anonymized sounds like an absolutely brilliant process to, to, to be using. That's, that's very good practice. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so um, tip four, ensure you gain valid consent. So in order to make sure that research data can be made available for future reuse, it is important that consent for future reuse of the data by other researchers is sought by participants. So in the past, we would be um, collecting consent to collect data and to process it for the purposes of research. But now when we're collecting data, we also need to gain consent to share and archive the data. And usually this will be anonymized data, um, but you still, for ethical purposes, need to gain that consent to archive it and to share it even when it's been anonymized. So participants should be informed how research data will be stored, preserved and used in the long term and how confidentiality will be protected when needed. Um, it might be advisable for you to offer different levels of consent so participants can opt in and out of specific activities. So um, you may have uh, different um, data collection methods or you may have different places where you're going to use this data. And by having different levels of consent, people can choose where they want their data to be used, where they want it to be shared and which data um, they want to be used for which purposes. Um, there may also be a point after which participants can no longer withdraw from a project due to anonymization. 
So make this clear on your consent form and include a date that that will happen from. So for example, in um, the example that someone's put into the chat box about destroying recordings as soon as the transcripts are read and okayed by the participants and the transcript anonymized, from that point on, it's impossible for you to re-identify from those transcripts which participant is which, so those participants will no longer be able to withdraw from the study. And making sure that that's included in your consent form is really important um, so that they can understand at which point they no longer have um, the ability to uh, withdraw. Um, you should also destroy your completed consent forms once the data has been anonymized because the consent forms also count as personal data. However, we advise you to retain an example of your consent form and your information sheet and archive it alongside your data in order to demonstrate the consent was obtained to collect, share and preserve the data. It's also too important to think about what valid informed consent really means. Ensure that you can clearly tell your participants what you plan to do with their data using simple, clear language. They need to have genuine choice and control. You can't rely on silence, inactivity, pre-ticked boxes or opt-out boxes. The GDPR principle of purpose limitation is particularly relevant to researchers too, as it basically dictates that data must be collected for specified explicit, explicit and legitimate purposes and that it isn't used outside of the purposes that it was initially collected for. If researchers wanted to use data that they had collected from something outside of the original stated purpose, they would need to reaffirm consent from the data subjects. They're happy to, for it to be used in this new manner. Okay, I see there's a, a conversation going on in the chat, which I'm not going to weigh in on at the moment, but if if you want to, then you can. <laughs> um, so there are some really good examples of consent forms and information sheets on the HREG website, which I've linked to here, and also on the UK Data Service website. Now, in, in case you don't know who the UK Data Service are, they are um, the ESRC funded um, data repository for economic and social sciences research data. Um, so they work a lot with um, personal and special category data, and they have really fantastic um, guidance on their website in all aspects of data management. So I really recommend you check them out, even if you're not working with economic or social science data, it's a really, really valuable resource. Okay. So my next tip, number five, is to understand anonymization. So remember that anonymization and pseudonymization are different. Anonymization means removing all personal identifiers so that the data subject is no longer identifiable, whereas pseudonymization allows for some form of re-identification, no matter how unlikely or indirect. It may even be intentional, such as allocating participant IDs and retaining a record that links participants to their identifier. So remember, you shouldn't keep personal data longer than you need it. And because you can re-identify that pseudonymized data, it still counts as personal data. So anonymization is a really valuable tool and it allows data to be shared whilst preserving privacy. The process of anonymizing data requires that identifiers are changed in some way, such as either being removed, being substituted, being distorted, generalized, or aggregated. A person's identifier, identity can be disclosed from direct identifiers, such as names, postcode information, or pictures, or identify, uh, indirect identifiers, which when linked with other available information could identify someone, for example, information on workplace, occupation, salary, or age. So you need to decide which information you need to keep for data to be useful and which data, which information you need to change that won't um, stop your data from being useful, but will make it anonymous. Now, be mindful that removing key variables, applying pseudonyms, generalizing and removing contextual information from textual files and blurring image or video data could result in important details being missed or incorrect inferences being made. 
So it's really important to think about which elements of your data you can change and which, which bits you can't change. Because if you change too much, you might not have any meaning in your data anymore. It's really best to decide on your anonymization techniques at the outset of your project. So a good idea is to include this in your data management plan. There's that word again. Um, so costs for anonymization can also be included in your research grants, and it helps you to ensure that, in, that consent is informed and specific if you can give details of anonymization to participants at the outset of the project as well. And again, there's loads of really good advice on the UK Data Archive website. But There's a question about say, pseudo. Oh, sorry, Isabel. Yeah, yeah, go on. Uh, there's a question about using pseudonymization. No, I can't, can't say it. <laughs> you can say it. Yes, should we be <laughs> using it at all? Yeah, in some in some cases, pseudonymization is appropriate. Um, if, for example, you will be um, going back to your participants uh, through a longitudinal study rather than it being um, a one-off study. If you're going to be contacting them over a number of years, you might need to pseudonymize the data so that you can re-identify who the people are um, in order to contact them at a later date. But that key that re-identifies those people needs to be kept very, very secure so that um, no one else can re-identify those people. Um, and there will be other cases where pseudonymization is a useful tool to use. Um, I can't think any off the top of my head at the moment, but it's not a blanket no to pseudonymization. But when you're sharing your research data, anonymization is better. Um, if gender is an important variable in research analysis, is anonymization still possible? Well, um, I think it is. It depends how big your uh, study sample is. <laughs> because there's quite a lot of uh, people of each gender. I suppose it depends what your field is, um, you know, what your field of participants is like. If it was a field of 30 people and one of those people identified as transgender, for example, um, and that was an important variable, then that person would not be anonymized. Mm -hmm. But then it depends what the field is. Because if it was a completely random sample, then we wouldn't know who that one person was. Whereas if you were taking them from a workplace that could be indirectly identified, then they would be identifiable. So it's a difficult question uh, to answer about the, the gender being an important variable. And it really depends on your specific research, um, research project, I'm afraid. So I can't answer that question with a definitive yes or no. Sorry. If you um, have a specific question in mind, then please do email me and I'll, I'll think it through for you. Okay, so encrypting personal data. Encryption is a way to enhance the security of a message or file by scrambling the content so that only someone who has the right encryption key can read it. Sensitive information should be encrypted when at rest. So at rest means when stored on the university network or on mobile devices. Um, some storage options automatically encrypt the files at rest. So, for example, OneDrive automatically encrypts files. Um, encryption is especially important if you're saving personal data to a mobile device that can be easily lost, like a USB memory stick. Um, if you are saving data to a USB memory stick, please make sure that that is not your only copy of that data and that you're backing it up elsewhere, which I'm sure you all are already doing. Um, you should also encrypt your data when it's in transit. So that's when it's transferred outside of the OU to third parties. So please don't send sensitive or special category data via email. Use Zentu, which is a tool provided by the OU. I think if you um, go onto the internet and search Zentu, it will come up for you. Um, when you are using that, make sure that you are also password protecting your file before sending it, because Zentu only encrypts data in transit, not in storage. Um, 
and make sure that the person who you're transferring the data to is aware of their responsibilities with managing sensitive data and encrypts it on their end as well. And again, here is a link to the OU Information Security Guidance. Thank you for sharing the link to Zen2, Yvette. Okay, tip number seven, and something that um, I think it's easy to forget about is staying secure when working remotely. So if you're working um, in the field or you're just catching up on some uh, research while you're sitting on a train, make sure that you're aware of who can see your screen. Make sure you lock your computer when you aren't with it. Avoid downloading personal information onto non-OU devices and lock away any paper documents containing personal information. So if you're collecting paper uh, consent forms uh, in the field and then you're going back and staying in a hotel in the evening, make sure that you're putting them in a safe or something similar so that they can't be um, seen or accessed uh, by anyone else. And again, here's a link to the information security guidance. Look after your physical data as well. And again, this is something that is easy to forget about. So everything that I've spoken about today relates to physical as well as digital data. Make sure you're locking your personal data away. Uh, it might be in a locked filing cabinet. Um, destroy paperwork when you no longer need it. Don't just leave it lingering in that filing cabinet for the next 30 years if you're collecting consent forms, for example. Um, and think about how you're storing physical data while working in the field, which I've already just touched on. Also, if you are collecting physical data, um, make sure that you're creating copies of it um, so that it's not your unique copy of your data. So either scan it and store it in a digital format or create an alternative paper document of it or something like that, just so that you aren't relying on one piece of paper. Okay. Now, uh, I would say yes, get a paper shredder to destroy hard personal paperwork properly. Um, at the, if you're allowed to go back onto campus, there are loads of paper shredders on campus. Unfortunately, a lot of us aren't back on campus yet. So I have myself uh, purchased a paper shredder over lockdown, which I keep in my garage. So yes, it is a good investment and they only cost about 25 quid. So you can use it for your bank statements as well as your research. Buying in the fireplace on Christmas is also a good idea. <laughs> Okay, um, so here are some links to some useful resources. So we've got uh, the website, which I've already talk, spoken about, the blog I've already spoken about, Information, Secure, uh, Information Commissioner's Office. Then there is the SESTA ERIC Data Management Expert Guide. That is a training resource, which is really useful. It's um, aimed at social sciences data, and it takes you through loads of different um, aspects of data management, including uh, working with personal data. UK Data Archive uh, and Data Service, I've already spoken about. HREC, Data Protection and Information Security, I've already spoken about. And I will be sending out these slides so you have access to all of these links and all of that information is really, really useful. Okay, so we've got, oh, unfortunately, we've only got six minutes for questions. I tried to get through that a bit quicker, but I didn't manage it. So we've got six minutes for questions and um, while we're doing questions, I'd also just like you to have a look at this feedback form, which has two questions about what you liked about the session and what you would change. And if you could fill that in, it will help us to um, inform our changes of these sessions in the future. Thank you. Um, OK, there's a question about audio and video material and how to protect it. Now, there's two aspects to this, I would say. Um, First of all, when you're in the field and you're collecting your audio and video material, you will probably have it on a recording device before you upload it to your um, shared server or SharePoint or wherever you're storing your data. So it's really important straight after you have collected that data and it's sitting on your recording device that you're keeping that recording device secure, either on your person 
or when you get back to wherever it is that you're staying, where you live or your office, that you're locking it away until you've had a chance to um, upload it to wherever it is that you're going to be storing that material. Now, once you have uploaded it to uh, wherever it is that you're going to store it, you then need to think about um, if it con contains personal information, you probably want to password protect it or encrypt it at rest. And then um, you will probably want to anonymize it in some form. And actually anonymizing audio and video data is quite difficult. So in terms of audio data, we would say um, a transcription is the best thing. Um, an anonymized transcription, unless the audio material is like the, the actual physical recording is your data, the way that the person's speaking, for example, if that's your data, then obviously transcription anonymization won't work for you. So you could do the onerous task of bleeping out the bits of personal information that will take you a long time, or you could just admit defeat and say, this data has to remain personal data. There's nothing I can do about it. And that is a perfectly legitimate thing to say um, when you would spend longer actually anonymizing your data than you would doing your research. Similarly, for video data, if it contains personal data that you don't have consent to share, this is something that you're probably going to end up spending far too long anonymizing. And it might actually remove meaning if you um, try to blur images and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, AV material is hard to make anonymous. But in terms of storage, important about thinking about it when it's on the recording device and then when it's on um, wherever it is that you're eventually going to be sharing it, uh, saving it, so SharePoint or your shared server or wherever, make sure you're um, encrypting it. Hope that answers your question. There's another question there about where to find data protection regulations in non-EU countries. Oh, do you know, this is quite hard. Um, and I have worked with uh, quite a few researchers who are working with people in Africa. Um, and it does take a long time to find the data protection regulations. So if you would like some help, then please get in touch with me because it is quite a difficult thing to do. Um, and I can't give you a blanket answer to the to the question, I'm afraid, because some countries just don't have data protection regulations still, um, especially if they're developing countries. OK, is there any other questions? I'm trying to scroll through, but I'm. I think you've covered all of them now. OK, brilliant. OK, um, thank you so much for coming, everyone. And please do fill in the um, feedback form if you have time. It should only take you about 30 seconds, really. Um, and hopefully we'll see you at the next session, which I believe is on um, data sharing. Thank you so much for coming.